Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, I'd like to introduce Paolo Baggia. Um, Paolo is from Loquendo, and um, I've worked for a number of years with Paolo on voice standards, the, especially when I was active in the voice browser working group work at the W3C. Uh, Paolo specializes in TTS, but also knows a lot about ASR and multimodal interfaces and all that good stuff. Um, he focuses in his own work on the pronunciation lexicon work at the, in the voice browser working group, as well as SSML. Um, I let him, this is actually a continuation of the talk that he started when he gave, uh, when he visited us last year, where he sort of gave part one of this talk. And uh, so this is part two of the talk. And for those of you who missed part one, it's still up on YouTube. So take it away, Paula. Thank you very much, Raman. Um, Yes, this is a second part. We already gave the first last year that was mainly concerned about the speech technology. This time we will enter more in the context of standards. I will try to give you the picture of what happened in the last years and what's going on today. I will mainly talk of two standard, two groups. One is uh, the voice browser working group, and the other one, the multimodal interaction. Both of them are part of the W3C. <clears throat> Only two words on Loquendo. Loquendo is a technology producer company that creates engines for ASR, TTA, speaker verification in multiple languages. We have today 26 languages and 62 voices. We are based in Italy, in Torino, in the northwest part of Italy, but we have a few offices around the world, one also in the US. Our technology are recognized to be very good. First of all, the TTS, but also the ASR and all the other one are catching up. Okay, now we start. The two main standard body that I'm following are the W3C and the ITF. Both of them have groups interested in the exploitation of speech technology of multimodal. There are also industrial form. The major one is the Voice XML forum. This is a, the arrow of time that I showed last year that shows that Everything started at the change of the century. At that time, there was people that were thinking, why not we change the way we use the speech technology? And the Voice XML Forum was the one to do the proposal of the Voice XML 1.0 standard. And that was the start. But in the following years, including now, we are completing the, the war that was started there. So in the 2004, Voice XML 2.0 and grammars and prompts, then updates in 2007. And last year, my work, that is the pronunciation lexicon, the PLS. And a few weeks ago, Emma, that is the first release of multimodal interaction working group. So if this was the picture that Jim Larson drew in 2000, that showed an abstract architecture of what there is inside the dialogue system. You should see there is the ASR, understanding, interpretation, dialogue, then planning the response and the TTS. This is how is the picture today. The large majority of the specification are now W3C recommendation. That means you can rely on them. The red blocks are module that you can completely control using the standard. I expect by the end of this year, 2009, that also the one is down, the call control, will become a recommendation. So the whole picture is full of standards. So we have reached the goal of completing this first release of standards. So what does it mean? That means that before the voice browsing, you had to rely on everything proprietary. Each technology vendor gave you their own API, their own way of encoding grammar or prompts. 
And also the development of the speech application was completely proprietary. With the advent of voice XML, of voice browsing, what is happening is that like in the web, you split the things into part. All the voice application, all the content is in the web application, like the web today. The platform becomes a general purpose voice XML platform that takes download by HTTP all the content and interpret in order to realize the voice application. So this is the value of those standards. So from proprietary to standard platform, from proprietary development of application to the reuse of what the web has today in order to create the voice application, and the ASR and TTS and so on. So this is the story. Now we will do a tour. We will enter a little bit on those standards just to give you a few hints on them. It's impossible to go in detail on all of them because otherwise it will take ages. But I will try to give you an idea. We will touch ASR, TTS, Lexicon, Voice XMN, and also the call control. The first is ASR. The ASR today is based on law knowledge. You need to give knowledge of what needs to be recognized. This is usually done in normal application, writing a grammar, a context-free grammar. So what the W3C did was to have two coupled standards. One is speech recognition grammar um, syntax, and the other one is semantic interpretation for speech recognition. One take the syntax, the other one the semantics. Um, as the syntax is concerned, you have two different ways of encoding the grammar, but the interesting thing is that they are capable the same. One is called ABNF, is a textual form, another one is XML. So you can do the thing as you like. And you can do grammar for voice and also for the old IVR DTMF application. The SISR is how to build a result. So you recognize words, but you need to create a meaning. You need to create a data representation of the result of the recognition. This is the SISR that is split in a literal and in the script. Let's take this very, very simple grammar with only a single word that is Torino, the place where Loquent is based. As you see, there are the XML on the left column and the ABNF. You see the ABNF is a little bit more compact. All the rule management is more compact on that side, while the other one is XML with a container grammar and then other elements inside. The red part is the semantics. On the top row is the literal semantics that is one-to-one -one mapping. I recognize Turing, I return a code. It's doing four simple things. The bottom part, you have the whole ECMAScript, so you can do everything you want. You can have function and so on. So it's very, very powerful way of returning results. So just to summarize, you have a powerful syntaxis formalism that can cover both voice and DTMF, and it, it was widely adopted. All the ASR engine today supports these two standards. To have two syntax is good because if you need to embed the grammar in a voice XML page, you will use the XML format. If you want to do very complex grammar, to save typing is good, to organize them in a more concise way. But you can transform a grammar between the format and the other one without losing nothing. Also, this makes open the road to have tools but unfortunately, I don't see too many on the web today that helps to create the grammar, to validate them, maybe to test them on written input, to test the semantics. So there would be, being that is a standard, the option to have some uh, <clears throat> tools that are independent of the technology vendor. Only a few little issues 
you need to declare the semantics that you are using in the grammar. So if you declare it, fine. The point is, if you not declare that, the spec is not clear, so that might be dependency on the technology you use. About the script semantics, you need to take care to pop up the result. In a grammar, you, cre you create Thomas rule, then other embedded rule, and so on. You create your own language. If you choose the script, you need to be careful that the correct uh, semantic result pops up. If you use the literal, well, the literal is very poor. It's only useful to do a single rule or one than more rule with one-to-one -one mapping. Like word list, you have list of city, you want to transform that in zip code and so on. It's used only to do those simple things. So using SRGS and SISR, you can create many grammar linked together, like web pages, I would say, with URI. So usually the literal will be the leaf, and the script will be connecting the result produced by the other grammars. In the SISR specification, there is also a description how to cleanly transform the result of your grammar in XML. And XML is becoming more and more popular as a result of the grammar. Also because EMA standard that we will return is an XML encoding. You can also do complex things like return arrays and other namespaces and so on. If you are interested, you can read that section. So as I said, the, these standards were immediately adopted. There is only one thing missing, that the PLS was finished last year, so there is not a normative statement inside SRGS. And also one feature that is used for disambiguation is not doable with the SRGS today. So we will need a tweak on SRGS or SRGS 1.1. Also, the W3C pushed to adopt XML 1.1 and IRI instead of URI. So there is no major missing from the grammar side. So obviously I didn't say before, you are free to interrupt me in any moment to ask clarification if something is not clear or I was too fast or something was missing. Now we speak of synthesis. Those are the steps that TTS is doing. Take a text, try to understand the structure. Even if it is an email or an SMS, you need to understand better how it's done. Then try to normalize, because one is what you write, another one is what you say. If you write a date in a certain way, then you would need to speak it in a different way. After that, you need to map the text you have normalized into phoneme, because for speaking, you need to use the phoneme that are the base of the spoken language. Then you can have higher level thing, like to give emphasis, to add pauses, and so on. At the end, you produce the sound that you will listen. The SSML cover all those steps with XML elements that help the author of a prompt to embellish them, to make them to sound better. <clears throat> For instance, the speak element is the container with attribute of namespace and so on, but you can also specify the language. S and in that, we are reusing what the people did on language text. Then you can structure the document with P and S, paragraph and sentence. You say yes if you know what you are talking about, if it is a date, or to add tweaks for speaking better using phonemes or substituting text. But you can also change voices using different criteria, emphasize, put breaks, and also try to change the prosody. That means to raise the volume, increase or reduce the rate, change the pitch, and so on. All those things that are not related to the word, but are in general for the whole sentence. You can also add audio, and this is used if you want to mix pre-recorded or music with the TTS. 
So TTS is a recommendation. But then after the, doing that, people asked new things. The most important one was internationalization. People from China, especially, or Japan, Far East, said that there were things that they could not do. So the W3C did three workshops, the first in Beijing, then another one in Europe, and the last one in India, to try to collect input from all over the world about what we have to do. And we discovered that also for um, Semitic languages, for instance, for Indian language, would have been useful to know a better what was the transliteration scheme in use, or if there were vowel or not, and other things. So this was the, moin, the main driver to continue the work on SSML. Another driver was to better fit the SSML inside the voice browsing. For instance, to have a, good, a better error handling, having attribute to clip or to do other things on audio. And a person, an expert on uh, engineering of audio said that the scale that we had in SSML that was linear was not at all good for voice because the voice is logarithmic in nature. So you need to have a logarithmic scale for modifying the volume. Otherwise, you will modify only on a tiny bit of the scale, and you will do nothing on the rest. So we changed the semantics of the volume attribute. Oops, I jumped to the last line. I apologize. So the SSML 1.1 is something more that was possible to, da to do in that directions. OK, this is the right one. Uh, a new element was introduced for having markup on words, especially for the languages that do not have word boundary. So they were missing an element for changing what they want to change. For instance, for Chinese was the tone or other features. Also, the lexicon was more developed. And the idea is that, being that the SSML is a standard, you should use a standard also for giving the pronunciation. That is not the reality today. All the phoneticians know in a language that is IPA, that is the phonetic alphabet produced by the International Phonetic Association. So at the moment, the W3C is mandating IPA, but is in the same time creating a register for registering new phonetic pronunciation. For instance, Pinin is highly requested for Chinese because it's the most known and used there, and also other for Japanese and so on. So in parallel, there is this activity. OK, this is TTS. Now pronunciation. This is something that I'm the editor of the specification, so it's something I know a little better. So you create an application, then you discover that the people do not pronounce the word in the way you expected, or you are mispronouncing something. So you won't change the pronunciation. To do that is important to factorize everything in a single document. This is a lexicon. is a set of change of pronunciation. Then the important thing is perhaps to share the lexicon between ASR and TTS if you are working in the same domain. So you do the things one and reuse for the two technology. This is PLS. is a simple document language with lexicon and a set of lexeme. The lexeme are the one that change the pronunciation, with a part that is the grapheme for the written, the spelling, and another part that is the element phoneme or alias for doing phonetic transcription or subtextual substitution. Today, the PLS is monolingual. This is not a big problem because both SSML and SRGS can include multiple lexicons. So you can include multiple lexicons if you are doing multilingual things. 
So this is an example. You see there is the lexicon. There are two lexemes, one for a name with the pronunciation of the name. This is a writer. And the other one is you have an acronym, and you want to expand the acronym into words. This is how you will use it in TTS. You will add the lexicon element, and then the lexicon will include, this is an example of a movie in Italian, the phonetization for the Italian of those words. And the same you can do in a grammar. You can put the lexicon element and then to have th these lexicon things inside. So the lexicon specification covers many areas like multiple orthography, homophone, homograph. I didn't enter it in the detail, but you can easily find them also in Wikipedia or in a couple of presentations I did. The last one was this week in San Diego for the voice search conference. <clears throat> there are still open issues on PLS. The first is the most important one is the engine takes time to support the standards. So at the moment, they are still implementing, but I think there will be short to release them. Then is the point of the registry to have the other phonetic alphabet uh, operational. And then to complete SRGS to allow the best use of uh, PLS. I skip this and I enter on the voice XML. The other important point was the voice XML language itself. Is a rich language, a declarative one for defining menus or forms to be filled by voice. So they cover input by voice or DTMF, output by voice, TTS, or pre-recorded speech, variables, and so on, events, telephony stuff, and many other things. One big point is that the voice XML, how it was defined, is synchronous. So you have not many ways of interrupting it, of having it to send events. Uh, the execution is always in a single point, called a dialogue, either a form or a menu. All the menu are queued. And then when it transitions in a point when it can accept the input, it will start to speak. speak and collect uh, the, the input from the user. Then there is the definition of events and so on. In Voice XML 2.1, new feature were added for doing things. One is to do recording, for instance, of a full call or all the recognition. This was not possible. Another one is add marker. And a third one feature is to have an XML data exchange when the voice XML page is loaded. Then there are other things more related to the telephony. So the point is, a drawback, as I said, is that everything is synchronous. And in order to change content, you need to change the voice XML page that had an additional cost. With the 2.1 feature, you can load the page and then fed data inside the page. And so you can change the application on the fly. And this makes more smart voice application. The data element is the one for assessing external data, is a synchronous one again element. And then the for each is for looping, for iterating on the data you have received, either to re-elaborating it or normally to put them inside the prompt. These are details on the data element, but you can find them in the specification and the for each element. So the voice XML and the other standard I presented you allow you to do standard voice application today and is widely adopted. All the platform now today uh, uh, allows voice XML input. Another point is the call control. Also, the call control that means to accept call, being there shipped or telephony called can be managed using a standard language without to having to do with proprietary things. 
this is the reason for the C6ML called Control XML language. You can do many things as accept call, do scripting and variable and so on, sending events, starting a voice XML dialogue, transferring the call, doing outbound call or doing conferences. Those are the elements. I will give you a few examples how the C6ML works because it's less known than the voice XML. Everything is based on transition. You have transition with an event. So when you call, for instance, you do a CP invite to a C6ML system, it will rise a connection alerting an event. From then, you can program whatever you want. <clears throat> Each event contains the data that you can assess in the body of the transition when you elaborate that. For instance, when you receive an incoming call, so you receive a connecting alerting, you can do some criteria on the number that you received or internal, perhaps, that your application is running well, and then you will accept or reject the, so you can implement your acceptance criteria very easily in C6ML. Other simple thing is when you receive an alerting, you try to prepare a voice XML dialogue. If the preparation is fine, you will accept the call. And when the call is connected, you just say start, and the voice XML will start immediately to talk to the person. Other thing you can do is transfer the call, obviously, when the dialog won't or when your logic won't, you can transfer the call and then restart, continue the voice XML at the end of the transfer call. You have many different kind of calls, of transfer call. Uh, you can also do things that in the past were not possible. So the C6ML can receive the HTTP, HTTP event, basic, and inject them in the running C6ML section, and also send events to external entities. So you can control what is going on inside the C6ML in an easy way using HTTP with C6ML. You can inject an event that asks to make a call. When the call is done, you can prepare a dialogue. And so you can do outbound call in very easy, easy way. When a dialogue is terminated, you receive an event. And you can decide if you want to start another dialogue or disconnect the call because everything is finished. So it's a flexible mechanism for doing call control. Uh, this is about fetching document, it's less important. So just to give you an idea, this is a C6ML page, very simple. Uh, the C6ML has an event processor that is the transition. Each transition has an event and other attribute that we will not enter in the detail. So with this simple C6ML script, you accept a call, you start a dialogue. When the dialogue is finished or the user hang up, you close everything. So the C6ML is to program things like this, perhaps much more complex for doing conferencing and other interesting scenario. Today is still not a standard, as, as I said before. Is a last call working draft. I expect it to be very soon published as a candidate. That means there is a test suite to show the implementability. But being that Loquend and many other companies already implemented it, I think the transition to recommendation will be very fast. So I expect in the course of this year, this summer, or this fall, that also the C6ML becomes a W3CT recommendation. This means that you see the picture, everything can be standard based. I think this is the value of the, wo the, wo the work done so far in the voice browsing wor working group. So if this is a voice XML platform, if you look inside, it's more something like this, that is our own platform. You have the network, today mainly voice over IP, that 
call the platform, which activate the C6ML first, and then the voice XML if there is the need of voice technology. And then there is another part that is an MRCP server. MRCP means Media Resource Control Protocol. Uh, there are two versions of MRCP. The second one, version two, is under the way in IETF and will be richer than the previous one because we'll include also speaker verification and other advances that has been done. It's important to know that MRCP v2 is completely SIP based, SIP and RTP based. So what does it mean, MRCP? It means that you can have a platform and plug technology from different vendor in a standard way. Or you can create your client, your, your fancy web application that interface a standard server that contain ASR and TTS. So it's another advance, this time inside the application, to make the exploitation of speak technology simple. Dave Bark, that is your colleague because he moved in Google in uh, UK, is the author of the first book on MRCP if you want to know MRCP, I suggest you to read his book. So this is what there is in a call center today. There are different ways. If there are seed based, they go directly to the platform. If there are no seed based today, the best way is to have a gateway, a voice gateway, that involve a voice browser, a voice platform. And the platform then using HTTP will be connecting with the operator, the data, and so on to run the application. But the interesting thing is that also inside the telcos, the voice over IP is taking place. So they are thinking to a convergent network where IP and traditional mobile or fixed telephony are merging together. In this new architecture that is called IMS, there is a place for the voice XML, the voice browsing platform, but not this. In this new network, when you call, the signal goes first to an application server. So everything will be derived by an application server that will contain the logic that you need to apply, and then will involve, for instance, uh, a voice platform for doing voice things. So it's changing a little bit the paradigm using the power of the voice over IP. OK, this was the first half about the voice browsing. So we have done a tour of what there is today and the status of the things that we have today. Now we can jump in another interesting area that is multimodal. So with Voice XML, you do monomodal application. That means speech only application. But with the richness of device that there are around, to be able to use more than one modality, to use voice, but also touch and gesture and so on, might be interesting. So we need multimodal. But multimodal means many and many different uh, modalities that can be audio, but also touch, also the accelerometer that is in the iPhone. I don't know if it is in your phone or not. So there are new devices that are coming, like keyboard and so on. Uh, the speech and the visual are good friends because they are very, very complementary. The speech is transient, so you need to listen, otherwise it's lost. It's linear, you need to listen everything. The visual is persistent. You can look at that, if you do some other thing, you look, it's always there. But the speech is useful when you ha have the hands uh, but for instance, you are driving or you are jogging, you are doing other things, you can use the speech, while the visual need that you use the eyes. And the speech suffer noise, so in a noisy environment it's not working well, but the visual suffer lights, so if you are on a beach, perhaps you can not see very well. So to have different modality helps to use the best modality for the given condition. 
being that a social condition or an environmental condition, or to do the thing in the way you better like. So if we started with DUI, uh, GUI, graphical user interface, then the voice get the VUI. Now we are on the verge of a new acronym that has MUI, or how we call in voice search, MUI, that is the multimodal user interface. So it's a new way of doing the user interface that integrates multiple modalities. I will give you a little bit an overview of the complexity that there is behind. So you have many modality and you need to control them. So it becomes complex to do the interaction manager that is the art of a multimodal application. So the W3C multimodal interaction working group did this. Define a unified representation for all the modality, the input modality. This is EMMA, extensible multimodal annotation. So with EMMA, you simplify the things because you have a uniform way of all those different engines that are talking with your controller, your interaction manager. EMMA is an XML language with a container the interpretation is a semantic result from one modality. You can have one off for aver to having and best, to having alternative, and so on. You have different elements. But the interesting point is the richness of the annotation. You have a lot of information that you can put on Emma. <clears throat> this is an example. If you have that uh, GUI, to uh, do a flight uh, inquiry. You can say, I want to go from Boston to Denver on March 11. What you will do is that you can generate the same Enma, either you speak or you use your GUI interface. So you simplify the application. But also, if you have the way of doing writing recognition, you can create the same Emma that will have the annotation, which is the modality that produces the input. Also, biometric, be that on uh, picture or on voice, can create the semantic result in Emma. So all different modalities can generate Emma result. For speech recognition, if the end best are popular to have, have alternatives, you can also have a graph of alternative that is much, much more powerful. This is called lattice. And in Emma, you can represent the lattice. So Emma is the way of representing things in the multimodal and also voice uh, world. So what we did is to have what was drawn in this picture, that all the modality can produce Emma, but also the engine can use, uh, use Emma, for instance, to have a log of what happened to compose the input of different modality and do other complex things. So this is accomplished because Emma is a recommendation, and the people can start to work on top of that. Another standard is for writing, this is called InkML, is a data format for presenting digital ink, being that pen or stylus or other different device, and allow the processing of and writing, gesture to sketch, and so on. And that is possible today in tablet PC, in PDA, and so on. So this can become a standard uh, language widely used. In InkML, you have traces, but also much more richer annotation that can be produced by a device. Uh, note that if you classify, you, if you are able to interpret the handwriting, then you can generate Emma. So InkML and Emma can be composed one inside the other. Uh, this is still not a standard, it's a last call working draft, but the people are working to create an implementation report. So it can become a recommendation in one year or not 
much more. And there is, I would say, an increasing interest by even big players to adopt this standard instead of doing their proprietary things for digital ink. <clears throat> and another important part of the multimodal is the multimodal architecture. In this case, what the multimodal uh, interaction working group is doing is to creating a standard uh, for the architecture. Uh, the base is to have a runtime framework. This is the basic uh, infrastructure where you will have module. Inside the runtime framework, the interaction model will control the interaction. Then you will plug in multi-modality components that will exchange life cycle with the interaction manager to uh, exchange data together. So everything will be event-based. This kind of architecture is a largely coupled architecture that is done also for dealing with distributing way of doing uh, uh, application. Uh, there are today already prototypes uh, done by company. One who is done by Deutsche Telekom, the person in the W3C. What they did was to use SCXML, we will briefly enter in that later, as the language to do the interaction management. And then they tested GUI in HTML and VUI in VoiceXML. So what they did was to do a HTTP IO processor for exchanging using AJAX way of programming inside ECMAScript data with the modality. And in one case, the modality was a voice platform with C6ML and Voice6ML. So there is still a lot to do. It's not close to become a recommendation. There is work on creating profiles on how to start up and register the modality component in the architecture with transport and many other things. So it's still something that will take a little bit longer to be accomplished. Uh, another, another new area that is emerging is related emotions. Uh, that is the Wikipedia definition of emotion. So the idea is for automatic things to be able to register emotion, capture from voice or the behavior, the face. Uh, on the other side, to convey emotion, to move from the plain TTS or a face that is not able to express emotion to be able to control them. <coughs> Uh, talk of emotion is a bit complex. Today there are many theories. This is one of a researcher or professor of the University of Geneva. It's not simple to define what means happy, angry, and sad. So he proposed to have two different dimensions and co to combine the value of these two dimensions. So from a research point of view, there is still work to be done on that to find the best representation of this emotion. In Europe, for instance, there was a uh, European network of excellence that now is an association. So if you are interested, you can go to the URI there and you find all the researchers that are exchanging work and doing progress there. So from a recognition perspective, to deal with the emotion means to be able to classify. Today, there are tens or more different classifiers. Two most used are Gaussian mixture model and support vector machine. They are the two one more promi promising to be able to capture the high variability of the emotional state of the person that is speaking. On the other side, for instance, for the TTS that we are talking about before, one way simple would be, well, the TTS is based on recorded voice. So I record the voice in many different emotional states. This way is not scalable, might work, but make the voices to become larger and larger. 
A new interesting way is to say, okay, I'm using a neutral style voice and then using um, signal processing techniques. I try to modify the voice to make it sound more joyful or more sad or doubt and to express something of higher level. So the second one is what all the research is concentrated in this moment. I give you a couple of examples of the neutral voice that changes to sad, from sad, uh, one case, to happy. This is a male voice speaking. I look forward to doing it again soon. I look forward to doing it again soon. So you see, changing the intonation makes you to perceive the same sentence in a different way. Let's try with a female voice. Let's see the next one. Let's see the next one. You see, it became more colorful. So there is a lot of work behind that. So I mean, the technology needs to find the best way of enable the user to use the emotion. Also in the face, in the research on the face, there is a lot of work in order to express in a facial way with gesture the emotion in order to have uh, embodied agents that show more emotions. Also in this area, the people started to create an incubator and make a first proposal in W3C. And in the next multimodal charter, there is a chance to have this work to be there. So what was produced in this incubator is a first idea of a language, an XML language, for expressing the emotion. Today is still a more research-ish thing with all the options that the researcher want to use. Obviously, being the standard must become more useful for final user for the industry. So there be, will be a discussion there. So this is an example in a prompt to have the new language with the prompt to express the emotional and the intensity that you want to change the emotion. And the same thing may emerge from the ASR encoded in Emma, that is the way of representing the result of the ASR, could be enriched with the emotional state of the person speaking using the English language. Not that to have a standard language also helps the research, because a lot, a lot are annotation. If you have a commonly agreed annotation way will speed up the research to exchange data and to improve the model that they are producing today. So also this work is part of the multimodal interaction uh, working group. So we covered what was the speech browser, what is doing the multimodal, and now we are reaching the end, that is what the voice browser is doing today. It's doing mainly two things. One is a language for controlling the interaction, that is S6ML, and an X release of VoiceXML, that will be VoiceXML 3.0. I will give you only a few hints on this area, so we will be fast. But this is the work in execution these days inside the voice browser. State charts. Uh, David Harrell uh, defined the, the, the mathematics, he's a mathematician of state charts, to make them very, very efficient. There is a book, unfortunately, it's out of print, but I'm almost sure that is inside your library by David Earle. And the uh, state charts were, for instance, adopted by the UML for programming interaction. What the voice browser is doing is to have an XML version of the state chart that is more simple to be used in a web-based world. The language is done of states, is a state chart, and transition with the transition that are drawn by events. And the events can have condition and so on. Then you can have a state chart inside another one. And the state chart are very powerful to be implemented in a very efficient way. So in principle, they will run everywhere, also in devices not so rich 
and powerful. You can also have parallel state char working at the same time that they can be synchronized one with the other. So there is an interest in both voice browser, but also the multimodal for the parallel things to control in parallel different modality by other W3C groups that are interesting to have an interaction language that encodes state char, and then university industries and so on. And there are already available two free. Uh, they are increasing open source implementation if people won't start to use the state charts. This is a, an example of a parallel you have in the top most part the UI, in the bottom one the GUI, so you can implement them and then synchronize them, for instance, in a multimodal application. So the idea is to have that the SXML is the language for controlling the interaction. Then this language will call and control the different modality, being voice, visual, accelerometer, gesture, and writing, and so on. In the case of voice only, there is still the use case, because what you want to do is to separate what is the application logic from the dialogue. So the 6ML can be the top part that controls the interaction on a more higher level. Then we will involve vo the voice only like a routine for doing the little piece of dialogue. So this is a way of using the state chart for voice application only. There are still things to do. The main is to decide on a data model, being that ECMAScript or not, or open to all the possible data models. And another big work is on profiling these to have different profiles, because the state chart will be done to run on mobile devices, perhaps, or more powerful one, more scalable, so to have profiles will help to use the state chart in the proper way. So the last point is in Voice XML 3.1. The driver to have another Voice XML are the one listed there. One is to be well-founded. Usually in the language, you describe the syntax of the language, not the semantics. So the Voice XML 3.0 will describe the semantics. So what there is behind the curtains to help to have a more flexible and extensible language where you can easily plug in new modules, being that speaker verification that is not there, rich media, also simple thing that is kind of VCR control to go back fast forward and so on on media, for instance, and helps to be modularized to also in voice XML create profile someone perhaps for rich media might be extended on the media, but not so extended on other voice features that are not interesting. Another way of making voice XML more flexible is in the art of voice XML, that is the form interpretation algorithm, the one that control how you move from one dialogue to the other one. In principle, that should be pluggable or customizable by, by the user. So S6ML will take part of the logic part and the voice XML of the voice interaction, but in a better way, well done in different contexts. And uh, the first working draft have been published in December. The second will be published in a few weeks. So is there? is at the beginning that people can read and contribute on this work, because all the work done in the W3C can be publicly published and receive comment from the public. So this is the end of the tour of the standard of the VoIP browser and Multimoda. If there are questions, I'm here. Otherwise, we can close. Thank you. Yes. Yes.
Well, the things are rapidly changing. I was a uh, few days ago in voice search conference. The advent of rich device ask for multimodality. So that will be the place. It's not the browser per se on your PC. That has not been the driver for the multimodality. But to have a small device, that can be a very powerful driver. Today, there are many different voice search. One is your voice search. And to have voice as an input, but also a device for doing and best selection for selecting different hypotheses in a different modality is becoming possible and useful. So I personally think that this is the time that the multimodality will move from the laboratory in the real application. And if it is done there, obviously it can also be done in a larger browser in, in a different context. So I think multimodality stayed m many years there, but I'm sure that in the next one or two years, we will see the thing change from that point of view. So are the devices that are asking for multimodality that give you good use case to use the multimodality to complement the modality to speak on the car instead of touching, writing, and so on. So I mean, they are not there, but they might be there in, uh, in the next year or the next two years. Raman, do you have any <laughs> consideration from your point of view? You were part of the, the, of the game. I think you're right. I mean, the mobile devices will drive it. Um, it'll be interesting to see how it will be done. Yeah. The point is also how you will do multimodality. Because I'm talking from the W3C point of view. Then there are other different ones. Today is very popular to do your own application. So you do go in the Google app, you download in the uh, Apple Store, you download your application. So you do all of them writing code only. This is one way. It's very popular today. But certainly, the way of using a browser where on the device you have a browser and the application are using more the web, being that there is perhaps more connectivity, more high speed uh, connection also inside the device, I think that is another way of doing the multimodal uh, thing that from my point of view could be more scalable and have not you to download all the things separately than to have millions of things not interoperable, but try to integrate them in a certain way. That I think is another way today we can, don't see that, but that might happen like it happened on the web. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.